Today I'm going to talk about scaling selfies OS to support multiple form factors and devices. So we have been working on uh, selfies OS for quite some time. So the history kind of backtracks to the to the ages of uh, of Nokia. Uh, to the, the Nokia started making these internet tablets, and and from that side of the, the kind of a development is. Uh, N900 is the first device that's a, that's a actually contains the modem, so it's a phone, but it has the, the Linux software stack in it. Uh, and, and some of the code that we have in our repositories uh, is, is actually the same components that are running on the, on the N900 device. Uh, and and in, the, in, the, in the, so that's the beginning, and now during this year, we have a multiple devices provided by multiple uh, device vendors. So it is really scaling towards supporting uh, supporting more more form factors, more manufacturers, more use cases. Uh, what happened basically after the after the the, the N900 device is that uh, Nokia made this and uh, their own Vigo product. So N9. Uh, this used to be developer machine for the N9. This is N950, and uh, uh, that had the same user interface, so the Mego Touch-based home screen uh, that 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 has uh, that is the Qt-based user interface for the first time, and main, main majority of the uh, components are Qt-based in there. So that that's where it comes to a lot of the Qt middleware. That, that went into this open source Migo. So this Migo 1.2 handset UX is actually the open source version of the Migo. So handset UX was a reference user interface for handset devices, uh, developed mostly by, by Nokia, uh, but the middleware there that was done majorly by, by Intel. So the Migo was a com combination of, of Nokia's and Intel's efforts in an open source way. Uh, but the strategies of these big companies changed. Intel went to the Tyson world, and, and Nokia decided to, to, to stop making operating systems and partnership with, the, uh, with Microsoft. But uh, since the asset was open source, uh, that, then, that there was an opportunity. So there was a few guys that took the asset, uh, minimized it, so throw away the stuff that's optimized for, let's say, car multimedia or uh, uh, things like that. And uh, just get what is needed to make uh, cute based products. So that's the Mer core. And, and then Nemo Mobile was the handset UX so that you had some apps running on it based on the handset reference. So that was the, the open source basis of this work. The commercial side of it is, is, of course, the story of YOLO and the story of selfies. So, taking this open source core that was working 2012 and making it a product, uh, that's, that's the next step, so making selfies. Uh, then there was a need to make the, the kind of own user interface on top of it, since the, the reference handset UX was very minimal. Uh, not really commercial quality in that sense. So a lot of the work went in creating the application, creating the uh, UI library, creating the experience of, of uh, what, what the device is. And then on the lower end, there was a lot of work on the hardware adaptation since uh, the prior platforms for was for Texas Instruments OMAP, and now on the YOLA, YOLA needed to find its, its own hardware. But uh, this <coughs> I will go into details of that uh, in the next steps. <coughs> then getting the first product out is of course the first step, but the products have a limited life cycle. Uh, there needed to be new products. The next product was to scale up to the tablet size to prove that the user interface is not just optimized for one device and instead it can be used in multiple different use cases. And uh, at that time, there was kind of a clear understanding that, that while some users were really happy about the user interface, uh, it also was maybe not as approachable to newcomers as it could have been. And, and therefore, there was kind of extensive studies on, uh, on uh, how to improve the core user experience. 
Uh, so that was kind of a rewritten to better fit the, the learnings and to better fit the tablet use cases. And, and, and so that was the same as 2.0 really. And it came out last fall together at the same time as, as we kind of uh, uh, finished the R&D for, for the tablet. And uh, work beyond that tablet project has been then for these uh, licensee products, mostly for these licensee products. So the Index Aquafish, uh, the Turing phone, and, and then, then working towards our partner. So uh, that's the overall story, what has happened. And now, you know, let's go dive deeper into the details of these steps. So this is now basically what we are, what we are offering today. So selfish for OS partners. We have a, the track record you saw. We have the kind of thing that this is like commercially available to multiple vendors now. Uh, we have now learned this uh, needs for kind of regional certifications if we target government use cases. Uh, we have been building this uh, base for these kind of uh, uh, corporate solutions going forward and enabling security things and, uh, and uh, the licensing strategy in place. So, so this is kind of where we have ended up with the, all the device work, so the, do, that is actually building up the asset of the operating system, which is which is uh, the most valuable item that we see we have. Uh, the operating system itself, uh, this is the, the architecture stack here. So we have a independent hardware adaptation there in the in the bottom. The left side of the stack is, is what is actually used in the products. Uh, so it utilizes Android drivers through a component called Lib Hybris. And uh, this is important since uh, the ODMs that you have, if you work, work, work into an ODM office in, the, in China or factory, so the drivers that they have are for these uh, Android devices. They will not make drivers for generic Linux. They will not make uh, drivers for your old custom OS unless you have a deep, deep, deep pocket. I mean, you know, Microsoft deep pockets, really. So uh, this Lib Hybris uh, is what enables us to run Sailfish on a, on a hardware optimized for Android. And Lib Hybris has been like uh, mainly developed by Karsten Monk, who has been working for Yolla for a long time. So. <coughs> That's the basis. Then we have the core of the operating system. So the 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 Linux kernel running on the on the on the on the device, having graphics through the Wayland, uh, having the glibc and lib standard C++. Uh, then uh, RPM-based package management, uh, various kind of a quite standard Linux stack, uh, things like systemd, dbus. Uh, these sorts of things. Then for the connectivity, Ophono, for the, the phone, phone man, for managing uh, wireless LAN and, and, and that kind of things. Uh, Blues for Bluetooth. Uh, this is mostly fairly standard stuff on, on Linux stacks and, and, and fairly standard stuff on, on especially with mobile Linux systems. Similarly, multimedia, G streaming, Pulse Audio, uh, pretty, pretty typical things there. And the majority of this core is, is open source and, and developed, developed in, in uh, uh, more Git repositories. And most essentially, then Qt is the UI library we are having. We are at the moment with Qt 5.2, but uh, we are still targeting to release uh, Qt 5.6 uh, during this year. Uh, and uh, it is looking realistic target still. And then on the top, we have the, the applications <coughs> developed by Olla, which utilizes the Silica QML library. Mine or yours? <laughs> so many devices. Mute all of them. Okay, this one. Uh, so, this is 
This is quite typical Linux stack. We have uh, the QML apps uh, is of course something that, that, the, that is not in the desktop Linuxes, but uh, I think to people that try to make uh, either mobile Linux or nowadays a lot of things that like this multimedia displays like uh, the ones you can find in cars or airplanes or uh, a lot of those things are nowadays written in QML. It's good for this kind of a embedded use cases when you want to have a fluid touch-based UI. So, that was the, the software stack we have today. Uh, the development of the so software stack really started uh, on these N9 and N950 devices. So, here I have uh, one of the first demo versions uh, of the Sailfish OS. So, I think this is the uh, uh, same version of software that was shown by, by Mark Dillon in the Yola Love Day uh, three years ago. So, uh, it has the same app grid. It has the, the old events view here still, so you can drill down to the, to the details here and uh, comment on. And, uh, the gestures were already then, the icons are the old ones. And uh, it runs quite nicely. The thing is that, that uh, the basis of this software is quite different. So the, the Qt version is, is 4.8. Uh, and, and in Qt, this kind of the first number always indicate major leap. So Qt4 uh, is not necessarily binary compatible with Qt5, which means that uh, the jump made a lot of uh, updates and, and uh, minor fixes uh, to the, to when, we, when we transition to Qt5. And even bigger is that the uh, N9 and N950 still utilized X11 based windowing and uh, and uh, M Compositor from Migo as, as the window manager. Uh, and, and, and this was uh, time before Lib Hybris, so we actually had native Linux drivers for this uh, Texas Instruments uh, OMA processor and, and the relevant, relevant hardware. And this was, of course, that because the Nokia had developed those, Nokia was a uh, uh, big pocket vendor at that moment say they, they had the money to do the drivers themselves even uh, even even on this scale uh, so that, that that made it possible to, for that hardware to have those things available and of course uh, since uh, this Migo was also demoed, the open source Migo was demoed those were available uh, then we started to move on towards actual our own device so, so this is the, the first kind of a Sailfish hardware that was targeted for, for the Sailfish itself. So this device is, uh, this prototype is called Leo. Uh, it was made in, in collaboration with, with, with uh, I don't remember the ODM name anymore, but uh, uh, the basic thing there is that it utilizes this ST Ericsson 8500 system on a chip. And, uh, and uh, those who remember the chipset business also remember that ST Ericsson pulled away from the chipset business about three years ago. So maybe, you know, one month after I got that prototype, ST Ericsson said that they are not going to make any, <laughs> any, any, uh, any of these processors anymore. So uh, we did some porting and we have Sailfish is running on that device, but unfortunately we couldn't productize it because uh, chip vendor pulled out of the chip business. For that device, the plan was always that, that it would be still this X11, it would be Q4.8, and it, it would be, would be uh, running those, that the, we would get the drivers from the, from the vendor to, to kind of a real Linux, and we wouldn't need to utilize, utilize the LibHypris. LibHypris was uh, maybe, maybe Carsten had done some hacking already at that point, but uh, it was far from, from ready and far from proven technology at, at that point. Uh, that was kind of a fun. Another challenge we had with the, with the Leo prototype was that it was only 500 megs of RAM. And since we had kind of just started the OS development, it was not really ready, uh, ready for that amount of memory. Uh, the, the 
N9 and N950 had one gigabyte of RAM, so those prototypes run always much better, but when you kind of cut it down to half and you haven't had any time to optimize, it's totally a pain in the ass when you're trying to do a multitasking device and you can only run one application at a time. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of horrible. Uh, but anyway, it, it still worked and uh, for a short period of time we, we utilized those devices as our, our hardware. And uh, for, from company point, one of the important things was of course that we started to learn that, that what it makes what it means to make a hardware adaptation. How do you kind of isolate the layers of software so that the middleware is not too closely tied to the hardware adaptation and instead you can port the middleware to new hardware and the UI on top of it you don't have to change at all. So uh, that was first step in learning how to do multiple, multiple devices. Then the first product. So Yolla Home. Let's look at a couple of videos first. So this is now the Yola phone running the Selfies 1.0 user interface. So gesture based, uh, fairly fluent. Uh, these edge gestures of, are, of course, the kind of core of the user interface. This multitasking screen or the home screen is, is one of them. And at that point, the notifications were, were in this shape. And the pulley menu is, of course, one of the uh, kind of uh, signature UI elements in, in our user interface. Similarly, the applications, the gestures is one of the key things. So, of course, you know, just tapping an element will open it up. But to go in backwards, you don't need to tap anywhere. You just swipe to, to the back direction and it goes back. And for accepting the dialogues, you can then swipe forward. Or if you swipe back, then it cancels. But when you swipe forward, then it accepts the language. There is, of course, an opportunity to tap on those controls on the top, but uh, these gestures are just uh, one of those uh, nicer things. So this was one of the, the points of the user interface that, that we would actually optimize use of gestures, since gestures are something that you can do with one hand. You don't have to reach out for tapping the correct position uh, instead you know, just swipe from the edge or swipe, swipe in the middle of the, of the screen. But so that... So the first product, uh, hardware. Now we are having a Qualcomm hardware dual core processor. Uh, STE was supposed to be dual core as well, but the, the N950 was single core. It had a one gigabyte of RAM, and then one of the things that, that was kind of a, a bit of work or a bit of pain towards the ODM was this the other half concept. So the back cover is, is, is removable. Uh, it is identified utilizing NFC, so you can have different color back covers, and, and the NFC identifies it and changes the kind of ambience. So the back, background color and background image and, uh, and even uh, like a profile on the phone. Uh, so so that, that's one thing. Then we had the connectors behind the, behind the device so that you can feed power to the other half. So it can be something like a keyboard or a, a smart, smart back color in that sense. Because with those connectors you can feed power and you can talk with the with the CPU IO uh, ports and uh, community did quite interesting, quite interesting back covers, uh, quite many of those. But, but I think the, 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 and the concept was very interesting, but the device volumes was not really big enough for uh, you know getting commercial level of, of back covers. But anyway, it was a really really interesting concept. But, but uh, of course, it made a lot of work for the team as well. Uh, operating system, so like I mentioned already, this was the, the Lib Hybris now. 
Uh, we needed that to, to get the Android drivers working. Uh, we ported the OS to Qt5 and Wayland. So this Qt5 and Wayland, uh, I think this libhybris decision was made together with Wayland and Qt5. So we didn't want to optimize the libhybris for the X11. That didn't make any sense. But for Wayland, we decided to do it. And that also meant that uh, the M compositor, which was uh, X11 based, we couldn't utilize it that anymore. So we needed to use this, this lipstick as a compositor. And so we, we brought uh, the window management functionality within the uh, lipstick framework. Uh, and uh, this was also first step towards scaling the UI up. So this QHD resolution is, is bigger than what we had in, 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 in N9. So we need to scale it up. And the way we did it was that we just gave a scaling factor. So uh, 1.0 was the exact same resolution as N9 had. And this was slightly bigger, so was something like uh, 1.2, I think, was the scaling factor for the user interface there. Uh, we decided to go with the PTRFS file system. Uh, we, we, these are, that's also standard Linux file system, but <coughs> again on the newer side. So this is, has been a kind of a trend that while we utilize standard Linux components, we have been taking a newer versions of the middleware. So when we took systemd, when we took PTRFS, when we took Wayland, when we took uh, Qt5, those were all kind of new and not really that much used in products, uh, maybe for some of the commercial products we were maybe the first ones to actually ship <coughs> with, with those things. And uh, some of these choices worked out nicely and, and some of these have been challenging. So for, for, the, for the YOLA, uh, the biggest challenge was to, to after the, the ST Ericsson change, was to really quickly port the stack that we had developed to Wayland Q5 and Lipstick and get that up and running quickly so that we can then develop the applications on top of it. And uh, obviously, when you do that kind of major change quickly, that kind of takes your time and you cannot implement the mandatory functionality that, that you know, consumers are expecting the devices to have. Uh, so that was a bit, big effort but uh, somehow drama free in, 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 a, in a sense that, that it, it still happened and it still happened quite quickly. In, in terms of a couple of months we had the, the new device and the graphics stack up and home screen up and basics, basics done. Um, Qt5, that was uh, maybe 5.1 or something was the, maybe the first version where we we were shipping the device bit, and that was actually quite rough. Qt5 has been a big change towards the Qt, mainly because the, the QML is the, is the main UI language. Qt used to have Qt widgets, and, uh, and uh, in Qt5 it's really changes the, the focus on the QML, and it's not, it was not really there. And uh, QML has a uh, um, of course, there's, a, there's a, the, the descriptive language, and you have mixed it with JavaScript, so you do need to have a JavaScript interpreter in it. And uh, there's been a couple of different experiments with JavaScript in interpreter in it. And, uh, and uh, there's always been some edge cases that do not work, do not work well. And, uh, and as a first company that utilizes UML in such a scale, so many UIs, so many screens. Uh, we encounter a lot of these issues, but obviously we had a, a capable guys, actually guys that were uh, in Nokia still developing the, the runtime. We had those working with Silica, so that, that helped us to solve these issues. And we did a lot of contributions to Qt at, at that time. Uh, So what did we actually learn then? Well, we learned that the, 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 the system needs, because the base system was package-based. So every component, so if you have a, a silica, it's a silica RPM. If you have a Yolla mail, it's a Yolla mail RPM. 
So learning the correct level of granularity in these packaging, I think that was like the main thing. And, and learning that when we do demos, we need to package those demos as well, so that you can easily replicate the, the setup, so that instead of manually hacking the device, the, the demo setup is just a one RPM package to deploy the device, so you can get easily repeatable demos. And uh, uh, of, of course, as a, as a first complete port of the software stack, uh, the hardware adaptation, how to package it, how to make the isolation uh, clear, that was like a, one of the major learnings as well. Uh, then, like I said, the, the Wayland Q5 lib hybrids took a lot of effort to, 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 to get it done, uh, get it mature, and uh, to get the features to the hands of consumers, uh, we needed to get the stuff out quickly. So uh, periodic releases was the thing that was what we wanted to, to solve that. So I think we started to have this monthly release cycle already quite early in the, in the, in the development. So uh, the device shipped uh, during December. I think we had first software update already during December and the next one in January and then uh, February, March, so we, we almost managed uh, a monthly, which was our target. And for that we had a huge amount of testers, we had a huge amount of tests, we have worked a lot on test automation, so we had uh, hundreds of automated test cases. And, uh, and uh, <coughs> a really tough prioritization so that that you know what will be fixed in which release. You need to be quite brutal about it. I mean, sometimes you just can't accept fixes because the fix carries always a possibility of regression. And if you do that, that okay, let's have that fix still in during the last day, and it has the regression, then you delay it again maybe two weeks. So if you target monthly releases two week. Uh, delay is already destroying that, so you will have a six-week release cycle. And what you can, that all of, also one of the learnings that, that uh, having multiple parallel updates developing at the same time is not a good idea. It's, it got, becomes a mess to manage that, okay, this bug was integrated into 201, it was integrated to 202, it was integrated to 203. And then you suddenly forget to integrate it into mainline, and it is a regression then on the on the 205. So trying to keep as few branches of the development open has been uh, one of those things that we, we learned in the in the updates of the YOLO. And. Uh, we, we also started to understand a bit about the scaling. We did a lot of discussion about which orientation the display panel is natively, which is, is in, the, in the QML, and how do we indicate that, how do we communicate that to the couple of apps that are not QML based. So for example, if you do a game and you utilize some framework which is not Qt based, how do you know what's the native orientation? And if we have devices, that have different panels and different native orientation. How do you uh, match that? And we, that's something actually that we still have uh, some, some work to be done. And uh, finally we learned that, that we were too early with the PTRFS, but we cannot fix that since the devices out there are already having the PTRFS. So PTRFS has a tendency to, to uh, get in a state that it cannot tell how much free space you have and your updates may fail and, and it's been kind of a bit, bitter struggle all these two years that every time we release a software update somebody's PDRFS gets in a twisted state so not recommending that okay, you're a tablet so this piece of hardware here. 
it really exists. Even some 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 of us is it real or not? Yes. But ah, uh, ah, uh, main main thing is the the user interface changes that we needed to do to 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 support this uh, size of display. So we did a lot of studies and uh, and uh, for example this one is a uh, uh, demonstration video done by the designer for the developer so that how the user interface should work. So you can swipe it again from the edge. Now it's a landscape oriented. You pull up for the application grid. You can pull it down. Uh, there's the event view which is slightly different now. And you can pull again to the, to the home screen. And you have a room for partner space on the side. Uh, here the Netflix just as a demo. And uh, that's the that's the base base idea, and we did a lot of this kind of uh, this kind of uh, illustrations how should it work and studies with users that, that what works and what doesn't work, and of course like always, uh, some people who have gotten used to the old way of working they were not happy, but uh, I think uh, overall we still got quite good satisfaction scores from from the studies we did. So the hardware then, the pixel resolution is much bigger. So it has about six times the amount of pixels than, than YOLO one has. And obviously uh, that means a lot of uh, need for band, graphics bandwidth, uh, need for a good uh, graphics processing unit and good CPU. The CPU is, is quite nice. That's that's. That has not been a problem. Uh, the, the GPU, on the other hand, then it's not as nice. I mean, the, this pixel count is just too much. So we had to do a lot of work optimizing the graphics stack to work on the tablet. And, uh, and uh, one of the major things that we did was this utilize this hardware composure. So uh, while the graphics stack in general is uh, OpenGL actually ready. The hardware composer uses utilizes some 2D acceleration features as far as I understood uh, more directly. So it's a little less burden for the for the GPU. And uh, we did rewrite the browser uh, graphics rendering pipeline uh, to utilize this composer as well. So the browser which has the, maybe the most problems. With the, with the big screen because it is really random bitmap that we have no control over. I mean, we cannot control the web. So we, we, that was a lot of work, but we managed to get acceptable frame rates with this approach, and, and we managed to get acceptable frame rates for the for the user interface uh, after after this kind of a, a lot of work. Uh, the other thing we had was this two gigabytes of RAM. And that actually was really nice. Uh, so we, we had a lot of memory issues with the YOLA one, and we did a lot of memory optimization. <coughs> because uh, multitasking is, of course, something we have been a lot of advertising that we are really strong in it. And, and if you run out of memory, the experience becomes bad. And then you cannot say that you have a good multitasking. But uh, the two gigabytes with that, the memory is, is very rarely a problem. It runs so many apps in parallel, and even the Android apps in parallel. So that that, that was a relief after all the kind of Yolla one memory optimizations and out of memory killer killing apps in random order and whatever issues we we had in the beginning. Uh, the two, two gigabytes was good. This X86 was a was a mixed uh, mixed uh, feelings about it because. Selfies apps, it's it's great. They run nicely. It was not a it was not a huge pain to port our our components running on x86. There were some issues that uh, uh, some some cases, you know, some variables uh, in ARM they are initialized to zero. Maybe on x86 they weren't, or, or something like that. really tiny. So one assumption here or there might be different in the middleware. So a couple of use cases were differently. But in general, in most parts, it was just recompiled and it worked. 
So, so that, that was nice. Uh, the pain comes from the Android runtime. So as you know, the Android applications themselves can have native parts. And if the Android application has a, a, a ARM native parts, and it's run on x86, that needs to be translated. And there was some kind of a translation layer provided by Intel. But it really did not work reliably enough. And, uh, and uh, we had a lot of pain to get, get Android apps. Uh, you know, and of course, it's always the popular ones that we worry about. So to get acceptable uh, list of popular Android apps running and offered. And, and our uh, partner, the, the Aptoid, who, who provides the Android app store, I don't understand how they didn't really, how they were not able to source these x86 versions of the, of the apps, uh, even when they existed. And so the, the, that, that side of the things had issues, and uh, uh, so the translation layer had issues, and our partner had issues in getting the apps. So the app offering was never great, uh, great on the on the tablet for those reasons. So probably if you had Google Play Store there, then it might be, might have been better. But unfortunately, Google just does not license it to everybody just for the kind of uh, official Android. Um, yeah, uh, one of the other kind of challenges was that that uh, we utilize different ODM for the, for the hardware. So whenever you start working with the ODM, uh, so the manufacturer in, in, in Shenzhen, there's a certain process how they manufacture these things. And uh, we had the new one. We had learned a lot how to work with ODM for, from the Yolla phone, but then the, the new, new, new had new challenges. And of course, we had to explain them the same things again that we had learned from the first product. And you know, our hardware adaptation chief, uh, Marcos Alco, probably had quite a lot of mice my, in, in his Finnair Plus card, flying to the Shenzhen and sorting this out and flying back to Finland again. So if you can work with the same ODM, please, that's a good idea. Uh, yeah, uh, for scaling the UI to these tablet form factors, uh, this the resolution was a lot higher. So it was something like uh, 330 dots per inch. When the, the Yolla one, it was 250 or something. And the amount of pixels were bigger. And, uh, so of course the applications now need to know that, uh, that how big the screen actually is, how much should I scale myself, uh, is the device landscape or portraits is in the in the tablet use case people use much more portrait and we did much more uh, portrait uh, applications and in some cases you want to have different layout uh, because the screen is so bigger. So our home screen is a good example of that that the Events view is a list view on a, on a mobile phone since it's so small and the, the shortcuts are just on top of the list in, in a fully menu. But on tablet it is uh, two columns and, and the column on the, on the right has the actions and, and the, then the, the list of the events is, is on, the, on the left column. So you need a different layout so you need to, uh, the, the UI tool it needs to tell uh, the application that, okay, this category of device is a tablet category and, and, this, and the, the size of the UI is this and now it's on this layout. So getting all of those enablers in the UI toolkit and getting the scaling factors there and uh, giving the guidance. So like we have these constants, you shouldn't, you shouldn't ever uh, use a pixel size for your fonts. Instead, you should use a constant that is it a medium size, is it uh, big, is it small. So all of that uh, UI scaling work was, was needed to get it, get it uh, for the tablet use cases. Uh, for, the, for the file system, we had learned our lesson. We, we dumped the FS 
and this device ships with X4 file system. And then one of the things uh, which we have tend to solve was the factory reset. So one of the good sides in the better I suppose that uh, you can make snapshots and you can go back to a snapshot of the file system state. So factory reset is simply that you make a snapshot when you have the uh, image flashed for the first time and that's it. When you factory reset the device you just go back to that snapshot. On X4 that was not possible and instead we just utilized the, the, the uh, backup partition uh, or restore partition there and when you do factory reset uh, it just installs the image from that, that partition so it uh, consumes more space and more kind of a brute force type of uh, solution but works and uh, X4 has been reliable in the, in the products since so we are quite happy that we dumped the better FS have a trusty base again. Uh, of course, tablet has a slightly different configuration. So we took our first steps to a variant support in the tablet project so that uh, it has a, you know, there's no point, there's no point in including a phone application in a tablet which of course, you cannot call it, it doesn't have a cellular modem, so, so uh, learning a bit about that was important. After the tablet, we had the Yolla C, and we had the Index Aquafish. So, back to phones again. So this is the introduction video for the Index Aquafish on the Mobile World Congress. And this is the Selfish 2 experience on Aquafish. So the hardware then, so basically this is, the hardware is almost the same in both Aquafish and Yola C. So there's a slightly different radio bands because India has a, a different uh, 4G bands. A lit, no, not all the same. Some, of, some are the same, but some are different. Uh, but mo mostly it's the same apart from the, the back cover and the packaging and then the software contents. So we have a 720p display, so slightly bigger than Yolla 1, but uh, still the, the difference is not huge. Uh, we have a FM radio hardware built in. We have a, another Qualcomm chipset. Uh, the Yolla 1 had also Qualcomm chipset, so, so we had uh, kind of learned, learned the Qualcomm chipset working, with, working quite well. So it was not a dramatic change, even though it's not the same chipset. Uh, two gigabytes of RAM, so that's nice. And uh, dual SIM support. And dual SIM is, is, a, is a not so important here in Finland. But uh, uh, in India, it's one of those must-have things. And I think it's many countries, especially emerging markets, the dual SIM is one of those mandatory features. And it needs to be working well, and the experience needs to be good, so that the consumers will accept it. Now, uh, the, from our point of view, these are variants of the same hardware. So even though they have the different bands, which means slightly different modem, modem firmware, it's still a variant. But uh, being a variant, there needs to be support for uh, different device names, 
different uh, device manufacturers, different kind of preload content, and even some behaviors uh, index requested to have differently than, than what we see as a, as a safest type of uh, working. And we need to be able to make updates uh, uh, flexibly to Aquafis so that it will not block us from delivering updates to our devices. Instead, uh, with partner device, we of course need approval from the partner that when can we uh, release an update to it. So, the challenges in, in developing these were basically the, the final, financial troubles from, from last year. So, the corporate structure was not the same as it was earlier. So, some people chose to leave. Uh, so we lost a lot of competent engineers at that time uh, and uh, the discussion with Intex was of course challenged because the, the schedules we had promised and uh, the scope of features that we had promised had to be reno renegotiated. Uh, of course we, we uh, got the thing settled down and started working on it so that, that, that happened but anyway it was a big challenge at that point. And this was the first partner device that we were making and we had not prepared all the variation points in the user interface. So uh, these names, manufacturers, Bluetooth names, when you connect to MTP, what name does it give? Uh, the behaviors, we all had that configurability needed to build into the operating system and it needed to be built into the, into the build infrastructure so you needed to have repositories for customer content. You needed to have options of including or not including that in certain builds. You, you, you needed all, all that kind of infrastructure. And uh, uh, like usual, we, we learn by doing. So we did something. We made it, you know, ultra configurable. So you could well maybe not every bookmark as an individual file type of thing, but uh, but really we went far to that end. And then we kind of started to learn and, and a little bit group them to more same uh, uh, bits and pieces so that, you know, a browser configuration for partner would be one package, uh, preload content would be one package, and, and things like this. But anyway, we needed to learn, learn those and have the uh, configurability in place and, and, and how to do it flexibly. And when you do it, this once you must have easier way to do it the next time, so getting that in a repeatable way. Uh, of course, the, the, the working with partners, we kind of learned about the process as well. So there's always the, the, the list of requirements, so, so it is a cycle. You deliver, deliver a release candidate to them, they test it, they, they give you a big list of uh, bugs and, and some of those bugs are actually feature requests because they don't understand how the operating system is supposed to work or they just compare it to Android and, and they say that hey do this, Android has this, do this and then we have to explain that, that uh, hey sharing mobile network Utilizing web algorithm is that's not that, that that doesn't make sense. Use PPA too; it's secure, and uh, this kind of thing. So, living to learning to discuss with the uh, customer and, and getting that process in place that we deliver early, get them their feedback, and do this cycle and, until they are happy, and try to to uh, fix the box and then try to talk them out of requiring features that do not make sense. But uh, that's, a, that's a, uh, a lot of talks and a lot of, uh, lot of work to get that done. And once again, we had a different ODM again. And now that the, the, the ODM is manufacturing the device for our customer, our customer also has uh, demands toward the manufacturing process. So, so we had to learn the kind of testing process they had in place for the factory and have the necessary enablers in place for the, for the testing. 
so so the building testing will be improved that a lot added uh, the tests for durability and uh, things like that and uh, and those are good things and uh, those are they are useful and we also added this uh, a special factory testing mode so that in factory we provide them different limits than we utilize ourselves so the first time in factory the device will put in chinese it will skip all the tutorials it will uh, start the testing tool automatically so that the, the manufacturing line worker just needs to run the tests with the device and if it's all green then you know then she will just uh, factory reset the device and put it in the box and if it's not all green then the, the device will be inspected that if there is an issue but uh, that that reduce the, the time it took to test one of these devices in the in the factory considerably and, uh, and again it was important learning and will help us with the with the next devices we work with then the Touring phone. So I have here the kind of a, a fancier version of the touring phone. So this kind of a, a interesting golden color. Uh, the hardware. This is the chipset is actually quite close to the to the Nexus 5. What Nexus 5 has, uh, but. Uh, the fingerprint sensor is something that's new to us. The display is full HD and 5.5 inch, so again driving a bit uh, bigger display, but the chipset is, is fast enough to drive full HD, so no problems there. Uh, 3 GB RAM, and first time for us is 13 megapixel camera. Uh, then for the, the operating system side of the things, uh, we really needed to rewrite the device log code to, to support this fingerprint uh, sensor, and we really needed to uh, needed to reverse engineer the Android driver for the fingerprint sensor. So we didn't get any docs for that, so that was a bit challenging. But anyway, we got it working reliably and, uh, and uh, get the UI implemented and we rewrote the device log architecture so that it's now easier to add new, new methods to that. And uh, even though we had kind of learned in, in the previous devices already how to efficiently work with the, the hardware adaptation on the Qualcomm, still it kind of took surprisingly a big amount of time when we got the packaging done uh, correctly. So we have this thing called the hardware adaptation development kit, which enables uh, our community developers to do uh, custom porting of the Selfies OS to you know their favorite hardware essentially. And we had a, a quite nice port of Selfies for this uh, Nexus 5 device, and uh, that's. Very close in terms of the chipset towards the Turing phone, but still it took us something like uh, maybe two months to properly package that for the OBS build system that we are, we are utilizing. And that, that was something that we did not expect to have that many, that many issues. So typically one of the things is that uh, this hardware adaptation, the code base is, is huge, it's gigabytes of of stuff so that packaging that correctly uh, is somewhat painful in some cases and uh, for this it took, it took surprisingly more so we have the device running nicely but we couldn't do the builds in our build infrastructure and uh, having it in our build infrastructure is kind of one of those things that enables then us to configure it easily to test it to do uh, development with the big team, so we really needed that. But uh, uh, that was that was one of the challenges. Um, another challenge was that 
that it's because this touring industry is a small company, uh, like a startup, that uh, we had some difficulties in getting uh, enough uh, prototypes and uh, enough prototypes from the um, same uh, or the latest stages. So if you have a slight hardware difference between each prototype you have, it's difficult to say that when it's a matter of uh, that prototype version, so it's a hardware issue, or is it something in our adaptation or in the software. So having a more of those devices in the beginning would have helped us a lot of getting it out quicker. Uh, then finally, with this phone, we are working on, on upgrading the Bluetooth stack. So it has been a, a requirement from the customers to support the Bluetooth low energy. And the blue stack we have in earlier products didn't support that. So we now need to learn how to live with two different versions of the blues so that we can have a, a blues 4 in the, in the older products and blues 5 in the newer products that, that will be certified for Google Low Energy and Google 4 Energy Low. And uh, that's work ongoing and I think we have the approach right but we have not, we have not shipped it so I'm not going to brag about it yet. But the important thing for this device. So, <coughs> how do we do this configuration? I already mentioned that the hardware adaptation is, is, is kind of independent, so you can have the, the core OS, service OS, service OS core, on top of any hardware that kind of is done according to, to our uh, hardware adaptation guidelines. And uh, to prove that point are the devices that you saw here, but also there's about 40 community ports already available. So the, this, this approach really scales to different hardware. But on the top, the, the thing that is that how do we customize these releases to our different variants, different customers, different form factors. So we have now this uh, configuration API. So essentially, certain way of packaging features that are, are needed, and then the necessary tooling in our build infrastructure to, you know, to pick features you want. So we have a tool called, tool called Imager, and it is really so that I can just pick up that, do I want exchange support, do I want uh, uh, Android runtime, and then say to the Imager that make an image out of the options that I have chosen. And currently, uh, on a higher scale, these are the kind of things that we support. So super apps or the partner spaces. Uh, for example, the Index, Index phone has this Ghana music player in the partner space, so you can always swipe to it. Uh, our own device doesn't have any partner spaces. And uh, depending on customer, there might be one to two partner space apps on the site. But anyway, you can configure that based for, for, for customers. Uh, then you can configure which ambiences so you have, so what background pictures, what color, what sounds are included. Then you can configure the preload content, so what pictures appear in the gallery, what videos appear in the gallery, what are the browser bookmarks, uh, and then uh, what pre-installed apps there will be. So there's not much Android apps, or our device don't have it. As uh, Yola C has here maps, uh, but uh, the, the, the index Office has a couple of Android apps, and then Turing has their own, so you can configure those. And then some different behaviors, like default times or certification data, uh, photo format size, and these sort of things. And it's, it's basically all package based. So uh, based on the configuration you choose, different packages are installed. And uh, typically the package contains, for example, browser bookmarks. They are a JSON file. So the, the package, the RPM package just installs that, uh, that, that file onto the image. And 
and that's it, enough for the bookmarks. If you want to change the search engine, there is a setting for that. And there we have uh, the package contains this kind of a uh, one-shot script, which is shot, which is executed uh, at the first boot. So at the first boot, it sets the deconf value for the search engine or something like that. And typically, all of these follow the same pattern. So installing some files in the device, potentially driving, running simple scripts in the, in the first boot of the device. And that's the, that's the only configuration. And we have configurations, of course, for, for all the customers we have. And then we have a kind of a plain, safety reference configuration that's not really branded to Yolla. Instead, it's, it's branded to a plain safety. And it's, it's quite minimal. So we would do that kind of uh, demo screen. Then we have the optional features. So these are mostly licensed. Uh, content. So it depends on the customer if they want it or not. So for example, in the Microsoft Exchange support, if you want to have it, you do need to pay patent fees to Microsoft. And if you don't want it, then we can just leave it out and then you, just, you save some money. Uh, going forward, these are the things that we are doing to, to uh, go more towards the business-to-business -business use cases. So these are uh, identified by our customers already so that uh, you might want to make a more closed version of the device when it is for a particular uh, more narrow use case. So it, when it's not, idea is not to have it as a general purpose operating system for customers. So then you might limit out things like uh, having store, having Android runtime, having a developer mode, having a side loading of apps. Uh, then there's the device management. So for example, the exchange protocol supports some options for device management. It can enforce uh, having a device lock enabled. It can enforce uh, some password complexity and, and these kind of things. So we are working on adding those options from the exchange protocol. But in addition, there's the mobile device management solutions in general. So this is a, uh, and then you, there's a kind of a different kind of levels. Some of those specs are really tight so that the device management can control basically anything on your device. And in some cases, it is like a, remote wipe, remote device lock, uh, find my device type of functionality. But anyway, working there, getting those uh, hooks in place to the operating system. And then the customer store, that's a thing that uh, if you want to have a limited availability of applications, so you have a, you have a big company, uh, hundreds of thousands of employees. You just want to limit the device to have uh, your company applications, so company email application, company uh, time tracking application, whatever. So having a customer store that only supports those and, and not Twitter and Facebook and whatnot. Uh, that's 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 one of the things that, that we are studying and specifying. And then uh, allowing custom encryption algorithms. So this is something that, uh, for example, in Russia there is the ghost algorithm that's like the, the thing that is government approved. And uh, allowing these kind of implementations is needed depending on, on areas where you work on. And, and finally, security is something that we need to address more and more. Uh, so keeping the kernel and, and the components up to date with CVE fixes rapidly. Uh, working on the file system encryption, so when you lose your device, or if you lose your device, uh, the stuff you encrypt it and uh, nobody can access it. Uh, VPN support, so you can access corporate networks, or, or even maybe some universities might have that as well. Then uh, boot and flashing security, this is kind of interesting that 
quite many of the Android devices out there actually don't, don't really prevent uh, flashing of custom images uh, and uh, uh, then, then uh, or verify verify the, the flashed image and or verify the first root so working on that yeah. and uh, then audit lock so that we can uh, kind of uh, certain things that the device does uh, are locked and you can audit what the device has been doing and of course doing this in a way that that doesn't take away from the kind of normal customer so that these are just enablers for the business business users. So the strategy is to go for these kind of BRICS countries to find these partnerships to be the secure and trusted mobile operating system for, for these markets. So there's the kind of a corporate mobile uh, device use case that's kind of well known but and then there's some various kind of home office type of mobile terminal use cases. It might be, it might be, you know, uh, you use you spoke various kind of purchases or things like that. And uh, having the local partners working with you all on the on the development. That's the that's the thing. <laughs> And uh, we do this so that it's fully customized. So you can have a device you want, you can have the functionality you want, and you can have a preview patch. So, to sum up, uh, after this trip, we have uh, four officially supported adaptations. We have uh, five products shipping. Uh, we have already made two adaptations that are obsolete, so the nine adaptation and the, and the ST Ericsson adaptation. Uh, we have uh, over 40 community ports running. We, we support x86 and, and ARM 32-bit. And ARM 64-bit is coming. And ARM, ARM Android 6 point, uh, Android 6 based hardware adaptation is, is coming. So actually community member already, already demoed the device running Android 6 point hardware adaptation, so that is doable and it's, it's going to be so those enablers now in place. And of course these are kind of needed because 64 bit and Android 6 and Android 7, uh, the next year hardware, whatever it is, I mean those are nowadays mandatory. There's no uh, not that many 32 bit devices out there anymore. For the user interface uh, we have now four officially supported screen sizes and resolutions, and I think uh, there are more that are kind of easily doable. And one obsolete screen size, so that's the N9, which is not really supported anymore. We have six UI variants, and uh, basically two form factors, so tablet and the phone. 23 supported languages, which are officially supported. And now we have uh, the community portal for, for the community translations and there are 32, 30, 30, 20, 23, I'm getting tired, 23 uh, community languages already in various levels of, uh, of uh, completion. Some of them are totally complete, quite many actually, but I didn't, I didn't check the stats how many are complete. But many, many community translations like we have the devices that are uh, for the UI, next steps are uh, getting the, the font size adjustable so that uh, if your eyesight is not that great, you can have a bigger font uh, even though the, the device resolution is still the same. Uh, having a high contrast mode so that the, you know, working on sunlight is, is, is easier. Uh, even more security features and even more configurability. And for the selfies 2.0, uh, this is how much we did. We had a one new application, we had a 47% more views, we had 56% more controls, 59% uh, of uh, more UI code and a lot of more animations to make the experience more fluid. And uh, this doesn't list the amount of uh, studies and, and user prototyping and such. But huge amount of preparation work before all this implementation work we have even started. 
So that's how we did scaling, scale this up for different users.